Hello and welcome to Yakima Chief Hop's Hop and Brew School satellite event. We are really pleased you're joining us today for the Survivable Compounds webinar as we explore more into this research and development and how to maximize the potential of hops. We have a program of speakers today from our technical solutions team, including Spencer Tilkmeyer, um, who's our Brewing Innovations, and then we have our Research and Development Director, Pat Jensen, and also our Sensory Research Coordinator, Tessa Shalati. We're really excited you're joining us today. Um, we have lots of details on the speakers themselves on the homepage of the Hop and Brew School event. So if you want more details on there, um, and also we have the handbook that we'll be walking through where there's page numbers located at the bottom of each slide. Uh, so we encourage you to download that if you don't already have that handbook. Um, any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat function on the bottom of the screen as we'll have a Q&A session at the end and we'll be pulling questions from that chat function. Um, we're, again, we're gonna just go ahead and dive into survival compounds. And with that, Spencer, the floor is yours. Very good. I think actually uh, Pat, Pat will lead us off here. One thing that I just did want to indicate real quick for everybody that's on the screen. Thank you for the introduction, Tony Lynn, is the numbers that you see at the bottom that are in blue. For example, this one says pages two to three. That's where you can follow along in our research booklet, uh, which is downloadable either on our website or the Hop and Brew School homepage. So uh, that's a great way to follow along in the booklet itself. It's, it's, there's a lot of dense material in there that we're going to walk through today. But uh, I think it's it's going to be a really fun um, a fun endeavor here, particularly because we've got the big guns, Pat and, and Tessa, on on screen here with us. So with that, Pat, please take it away and let's dig into survivable compounds. All right, thank you, and good morning from Yakima. Thank you for joining us today. So, so when we talk about survivables, we are talking about the hop aromatic compounds that survive the brewing process. So. Starting about four years ago, YCH created a new department that we called the Technical Solutions Department and began investing in its facilities to start doing hop research. And we call us Technical Solutions because we're not just trying to do research for research sake, we're geared to find solutions for growers and brewers. So essentially what happened is Nick, our VP, went out and got YCH to invest a lot of money in equipment and construction and people to research hops, especially on the hop aromatic side from the field all the way to the fine. So all the people pictured in this slide here are the ones that basically do all the work. So that's why they're in the pictures. So, and I'm personally grateful to each and every one of them because their contribution to the company and the hop industry as a whole is exciting at, at the, to say the least. But one person I am going to signify today is Jackie Hyde because all the hop analysis and beer analysis that produced the meat of this book right here, she pretty much did. So, so thank you, Jackie. So our facility consists of an R&D lab, which contains a lot of expensive equipment I usually make the joke when people come by and visit that the price per square foot in that lab is probably about the same price as a apartment in Monte Carlo. So the R&D lab has two GCMSs. Uh, one's armed with a GC is a gas chromatograph and that one is with a QTOP which is a quadrupole time of flight partnered with an SED and we have two HP, two HPLCs. The idea is in order to improve our understanding of hop aroma and chemistry, we have to be able to measure it. So the lab provides the analytical expertise and develops the methods needed to drive our research. So, and we also have an aroma dome, which houses our talented sensory team. And again, if you want to improve upon hop aroma science, you have to have ways to measure it. So with this, sensory team and with a whole army of YCH sensory panelists, it really drives our research. So, and of course, you have to have a brewery because if you truly want to test how hop aroma transfers into beer throughout the brewing process, you better have the equipment to do it. So let's, let's go ahead and move the next slide so we can see the research in itself. So, so the hop compounds that survived the bre brooding brewing process has been pretty well documented over years of research. A uh, bunch of universities and breweries have done a lot of it. 
And as we started out on trying to learn about hop aroma or get a better understanding of it, that's where we began. We looked at what the literature already had written about it so we can make good decisions on basically what to purchase and what we needed. So, but with being here at YCH, yeah, we have a unique vantage point. We really, have, we can really take a deep dive into hop research because we have a grower owner network and we ex accept over 40 million pounds of hops. So essentially we got all the hops to evaluate analytically and sensory wise. So, so being able to analyze beer and hops for the aromatics gave us the clarity to see what compounds seem to be the most beer soluble in the amount each hop actually has. So, so which basically gives us the ability to understand how to utilize hop aroma and hops to their fullest potential. So, so let's go ahead and see what kind of chemical compounds are in hops. So hops contain thousands of compounds and all of them are important to us from an understanding of how the hop truly is. It gives us an understanding of all their differences between varieties, when to pick them, how to store them and handle them. But essentially all of the other all of the compounds are important. So it is a challenge to work with because there is so many compounds, but for today, all we're gonna really focus in on is hop aroma compounds or hop essential oil. So, so here on this slide, we are looking at the compound groups that make up essential oils of hops. And on the slide, you'll see they're grouped like in two sections, the hydrocarbons and the oxygen derivatives, which is pretty fitting for this discussion because essentially chemical compounds behave in this manner. Chemical bond compounds only like to hang out with their own kind. Like dissolves like, a term that we call miscibility. So compounds that like water in water, like H2O contains oxygen as well as ethanol will contain oxygen. So hot compounds that contain oxygen and other polarizing elements such as sulfur will most likely solve, most likely dissolve into beer. So we'll start off with the terpenes and So terpenes, they're made up of isoprene units, which is a five carbon alkene chain. Alkenes always have carbon-carbon double bonds signified here on myrosine with the dual lines on its chemical structure. Monoterpenes like myrosine have two isoprene units, which are their building blocks. So a myrosine has 10 carbons, if you were to count that, count all the carbons on a myrosine. Sesquiterpenes like caryophylline and humulene have three isoprene units, so we, they have 15 carbons. So terpenes are hydrocarbons, contain only carbon and hydrogen, like most oil, so they are hydrophobic. They do not mix with the water. They are most abundant compounds in hop essential oils, which makes them important for distinction between varieties, but solubility in beer is essentially zero. So if it ends in E, it doesn't make the C. So even though I say that just now, they can actually, in reality, still show up potentially in beer. They require help and, and usually is done during the dry hopping process. And the only way they can make it in is by being part of an entourage. In order for them to get into beer compounds, they have to come in with another chemical compound that has like a hydrophilic or water loving portion and a hydrophobic, which is a water hating portion. And because these compounds can mix with both oil and water, they can bring in terpenes with them. So hazy beers, which have protein polyphenol complexes, can bring these hydrocarbons in. So you usually see terpenes when you have a hazy beer. But essentially by themselves, they're just not going to get into the beer matrix. So but those compounds that have affinity for water and ethanol are going to have common qualities with water and ethanol. So they will contain oxygen. So let's go ahead and move to this survivable compounds. So the survivable compounds, we start with the monoterpene alcohols. They contain oxygen and they end in all, just like ethanol. Because they contain a hydroxyl functional group or an OH group, for beer sol solubility purposes, if it ends in all, you just might get it all. So, 
esters also contain oxygen. So they'll have an affinity to water as long as they are relatively small chained esters. If they are larger than about 10 carbons, they can usually lose some of their solubility. Esters are easy to spot. If you don't know how to spot one, they always end in eight. And in beer, if it ends in eight, it will probably taste great. So esters are known for their fruit-like aromas and flavors. Polyfunctional thiols may not sound like an oxygen containing group, but that is okay. Sulfur in itself may be a slightly bigger atom than oxygen, but it's similar in most ways. Same bonding character as oxygen, it's very electronegative, means it's polarizing. And if you actually are a nerd like me and love your periodic table, you'll see it's in the same column as oxygen telling you it has almost all the same properties. So, and I always carry mine with me everywhere I go. It's on the back of my card carrying member of a periodic table. But anyhow, these compounds are called polyfunctional diet, polyfunctional because they contain more than one functional group, like a polyfunctional alcohol, like three mercapto hexanol has the thiol group and an alcohol group, and that's why we call it a polyfunctional thiol. More than one functional group. So let's go ahead and dive deep into the terpene alcohols. So geranium and linalool are the main terpene alcohols we see in hops, but at times one can also see narrow. It's just not as in the highest concentration. So geranium and linalool get most of the press, but they all look pretty much like a terpene when you look at their at their structure and almost exactly like myrosine, except they have that hydroxyl group signified by the OH group on each of these two compounds, which means they can interact well with water and alcohols because of that OH group. So let's see what geraniol has to offer. So geraniol tends to have a lot of fruity and well, mainly citrus and floral qualities. Some say geranium, some people might argue rose, depends on the individual. And of course it ends in all, so it's gonna survive. And if you're looking on our actual booklet on the chart, you'll see talus is the hot variety to note, has the highest content of this compound. So geranial gets the most press when people talk about biotransformation. And if you don't know what biotransformation is, it's a basically a way that researchers can say stuff happens. That's essentially all they're saying. They don't understand it. Just in the presence of yeast, geraniol seems to convert to centronellol and even sometimes linalool. And it's from a chemist's point of view, the geraniol is probably most prone to this phenomenon because it's a primary alcohol, meaning it's out that that OH group is on the end of the molecule. So it makes it kind of easy to react and interact with other compounds. So, so when citronellol, citronellol it can be produced from this geraniol, it's the citronellol in itself in the final beer may be very hard to detect and maybe lower than someone's taste threshold, but its contribution with the combined ingredients of citronellol, geraniol, and linalool are known to work in synergy. So they all three combined essentially have an additive threshold together. So they work as a sum of the three. So a little bit of citronol can add to the overall terpene alcohol contribution to your flavor and aroma. So let's move on to linalool. Linalool is essentially the first hop compound ever found in beer. And I believe it was discovered back in the 1970s. So it's very fruity. And some say it tastes like fruit, fruit loops. And if you're looking for a variety that's high in it, Laurel seems to be the leader when it comes to linalool. So, and it's a very commonly used compound. So if you go home tonight, you can check the back of your ingredients on soaps and lotions and your fragrances, and you'll probably see linalool somewhere on some of those labels, very common. So let's go ahead and get on to sulfur compounds. Sulfur compounds, they're generally easy to detect with our nose, it's probably most of you know through just your experiences, right? Most of the common ones you probably don't really like. Rotten eggs, burning matches, cooked corn, not exactly pleasant aromas, but. And sulfur comp compounds concentrations in hops are relatively low in part per billion level. They are very hard to detect with most conventional instrumentation. 
like our GCMS. And because they're low in concentration in the matrix of hops, makes it very hard to detect these compounds. So what we use is a sulfur chemilescence detector, which is a, a specific, specific detector for sulfur compounds. So, and this helps us so we can screen hops or beer all in one pass as you're analyzing on a GCMS, you can also look at what's going on in the SCT and SCD and what lights up the sulfur compounds as you're detecting for other normal aromatics, such as journal variable. So even though probably your own personal experience says sulfur stinks, some compounds at the right thresholds can be very pleasant, ranging from tropical light, passion fruit, mango, and some known for grapefruit, and others even black currant. In pure forms though, if you're ever in a lab and you take out pure forms of these compounds, you're gonna find they all stink. They're very unpleasant in the pure form. But most of the pleasant ones that provide these tropical aromas, they all fall in the category of a polyfunctional thiol. So pictured on the right, you'll see formicapto 2 pentanone the thiol group is known as the sulfhydryl group, or basically the SH. And we also see a carbonyl group, carbon double bonded to oxygen. So two functional groups where one is a thiol, so that's how you get the name polyfunctional thiol. So. Mercapto and safanol, if you look at the names of the compounds on, this, on the screen there, are very interchangeable. Although it's probably more proper to use sulfanol I know from working in this industry, I converted to Mercapto because it's just, just easier to explain the compounds because nobody basically when I first started out understood what Sophanol meant. So, but, so I've converted to Mercapto. Sophanol is probably the most proper, proper use. The one we detect very easily on the survivable list is 3 Mercapto hexanol. So let's go ahead and move forward to him. So 3 mercapto hexanol or 3-MH, it's easier to say, it's commonly found in hops and ends in all. So you just might get it all, right? So, so of course it survives the brewing process. So commonly said to provide grapefruit and even passion fruit into beer. And one of the other things it is, is a precursor to 3 mercapto hexoacetate. Now in yeast, there's a nice enzyme called alcohol acetyltransferase that converts alcohols into acetate esters. And the good news, when you have an acetate ester, it ends in eight, so it probably tastes great. So just be aware if you're a brewer, if you're looking at chemical compounds, generally when, a, when an ester ends in acetate, it's generally yeast derived, but three mercapto hexyl acetates precursor is gonna still be three mercapto hexanol. So. Let's move on to the other esters. So esters, also oxygen containing compounds generally form from degradation pathways of lipids and carbohydrates and proteins, but small chain esters very, have very fruity notes while the long chain esters tend to provide waxy notes. Short chain esters are very soluble in water and long chain esters, not so much. So less than 10 carbons are generally soluble in beer and matrix. And as the carbon chains get longer, as the solubility goes down. So the carbon chain length affects the solubility of all compounds in the aqueous environments. As the carbon chain grows on any of these compounds found in essential oils, you can generally say their solubility in the beer matrix will go down. So with that in mind, we can note Although methyl geranate survives the brewing process, its carbon chain length is 11. So its solubility is rather low. So compared to the shorter chain esters like 2-methylbutyl isobutyrate, which has six carbons and iso, amyl isobutyrate has nine, methyl generate is the least soluble. So we'll talk about these esters in order of solubility. So the first up will be 2-methylbutyl isobutyrate. Go ahead and move to the next slide. Sorry to, so, so two methyl butyl isobutyrate. Both of these esters I have listed brings a nice fruity aroma to the beer and possibly apricot. And just so anybody knows and wants to get me anything about mid July to late July, that's when they'll be out. That's my personal favorite fruit. So, 
Equinot, if you look on the graph of survivable compounds, is the highest variety that has the highest ester content of this variety. So, and just remember that this ester should be the most soluble of, in the group. So, our next ester is actually isoamyl isobutyrate which has nine carbon, so pretty soluble in the beer matrix. And he brings the life fruity and specifically pineapple into your beer, most likely. And again, Equinot is holding strong for this ester as well. So, and our last ester, which is methyl geronate. Methyl geronate seems to have a very common name such as geraniol. So has 11 carbons. And it's an ester that's not very soluble, but it still survives. So but because it's such a large ester, its aroma is not as fruity as the smaller ones, but still can provide very positive aromas to beer. And if you're looking for a, a variety that's high in methyl geronate, keep in mind that it's not the most soluble of the esters. Centennial is what you're going to probably look at. And finally, we have a compound I've been kind of avoiding to talk about talk about and that's the lonely ketone that appears in beer and that is two known and I haven't really mentioned ketones but we do it see at least one so ketones contain oxygen like all the other survivables but as a carbon double bonded to oxygen and we call this group a carbonyl functional group it's still polar because it but it doesn't have the same character as an alcohol like geranial or linalool. Alcohols are more soluble because of the OH group or hydroxyl group, which gives them this stronger interaction between like molecules like water or ethanol, which you call hydrogen bonding. So that just means the ketones are less soluble than the alcohols. So, so we are given two no no basically an honorable mention because he is surviving into the beer process from what we can see. But now they, century wise, they kind of fall into a sweet aromatic category. They can come off as waxy and buttery more than fruity and floral. So just be aware. So now I'm going to pass it on to Spencer and you can take it over from here. Thanks, man. Thanks, Pat. <clears throat> uh, for those of you that have never spent time in an R&D lab, I, uh, I, I don't have a background in chemistry like Pat does. And it's one of my favorite things in the world to kind of just sit and soak up uh, what Pat is, is saying about different chemical compounds. I never paid as much attention in my high school chemistry classes as I do to Pat, probably because I really like the end product so much more than I would have in those days. But kind of stand on the shoulders of giants here. Uh, one of my favorite things about the, the presentation that we've got for you today is we've got kind of three different perspectives on this research, right? Pat is a, is a chemist by trade and, and was responsible for a lot of the original creation of this research. I myself am a brewer by trade. That's my background. I spent 10 years as a brewer. And, and so a lot of this for me is, is what we do to establish a practical sort of brewer insights surrounding this research. And then Tessa is a trained sensory uh, um, technician that does sensory on a daily basis and is probably one of the most trained sensory uh, uh, folks in the world. So getting that, that side of the spectrum too, I think really encompasses everything that we, what we currently know about this sort of the survivables research. But to, to dive in here to this graph, this is kind of I, what I would say is like the keystone of this research thus far. Um, and to back up just a moment to, to really define what we mean when we say survivables, right? So this is, this presentation, this today's webinar is intended to be a pretty advanced dive into this research and, and not very surface level. We've, we've covered that in other webinars. But just to speak very briefly on what that means, the reason that it, the, the term survivable came around is because this is the consistent group of compounds that we see surviving into finished beer. And Pat has given you a good sense in the past um, few slides of what that really means, because as he mentioned, myrcene and, and some of the other hydrocarbons make up a huge portion of hop oil, right? And it's typically what we would see as brewers on a certificate of analysis. But what we, what we know now and what we're beginning to find more and more is that those compounds are probably not that useful to brewers. Knowing a lot about what myrcene content is in, in a particular hop variety is generally speaking probably not that influential on the way that you make beer, quite simply because it's not, um, it's not hydrophilic and it doesn't want to be in beer. It doesn't want to be soluble. So 
what we've done here, uh, I, I think the most novel thing uh, for brewers about this research is that it does put a fine point onto some practical tactics of how we can use hop chemistry to make better beer. Um, traditionally, hop science has not really pointed to practical advice. It's generally speaking research uh, that, that sort of maybe opens some, some uh, thought processes about uh, how, how hops, um, hop chemistry works, but oftentimes that, that next step, which is bridging the gap to practical sort of brewing technique has never been there. That's what I like most about this graph that you're looking at right now. Um, this is really intended to be more of a brewer tool than it is a, just a novel piece of research. And I want people to think about it that way. It wasn't originally designed that way. Well, a lot of this research was born of just kind of a lot of what Pat and Jackie and Rob and a few others were doing in the background. But the more that we looked at this graph, the more that we found that it has a ton of practical insights for brewers in it. And so we took this data set and we slowly morphed it into what we feel like is at this point, a very, very practical brewer tool. And uh, we call it the survivables chart because what it is is a sort of an aggregate metric of these, uh, these compounds that do survive the brewing process. And when, when I say that, I mean, they survive heat, they survive fermentation activity, they survive uh, the antagonistic effects of going through the brewing process. And that's what differentiates them. We see these compounds regularly surviving into finished beer. So that's a difference, you know, a, quite a different headspace to be in. Rather than looking at the thousand different compounds that Pat described earlier, we're looking at the seven that we see regularly showing up in finished beer and working backwards from there to have better insight of how to make, how to make great beer. So uh, this graph is intended to, to actually answer some questions. And those questions are listed up in the top right, such as what variety should I use? Where in the process should I use it? Which hops will work together in combination? And how can I use a variety to its maximum effect? As all of you know out there, there are more varieties available to a brewer than ever at this point. Uh, breeding companies are more sophisticated than they've ever been. Uh, new varieties are, are released yearly. What we also know as brewers that is often that there's just not enough time in a day to be able to, uh, for you as a brewer, to be able to suss out when, uh, where each of these varieties fits perfectly in beer. For example, you don't have time as a brewer to um, to try Sabro, for example, 10 different ways before you deploy it in a beer to just figure out the exact sweet spot for you. So what we consider it to be a, you know, kind of our duty as a, as a research entity and as a, a, a major grower of hops is, is to provide tools like this that can offer practical insights that do some of that legwork for you as a brewer and give you some insight about where a variety can make its highest impact. So to dig in to the specifics of the graph itself, what you see is, is a, uh, the major cultivars that we as a, as a, as a grower group uh, actively grow, and they're ranked in order of concentration, aggregate concentration of these seven survivable compounds. So I like to point brewers in a pretty basic direction right off the bat, which is uh, when you're looking at this graph, it's, uh, it's one of the, the takeaways that we can draw is that Hops that are higher up to the left side of the graph, so higher up on the graph, higher aggregate concentrations, are probably good candidates for early use in the brewing process. And by early, I mean what we would call like late kettle additions, whirlpool additions, active fermentation dry hop additions. That doesn't mean that these hops can't perform well in a post-fermentation dry hop situation. What it means is that, for example, Idaho 7 could potentially make a, a larger impact as a whirlpool hop than something like Azaka. By contrast, though, um, the hops that are lower on this list, uh, there's some heavy hitters on that list, right? Cashmere, Cascade, Azaka, we know these are great hops. These are not uh, hops that we want to uh, view in a more negative light as a result of this graph. What we do want to focus in on, on is where can we use something like Azaka to make its highest impact, to let it shine its, its, in its best light, so to speak. So these hops that are lower on the graph are probably best utilized later in the brewing process where they're... Uh, where they're less exposed to things like heat, fermentation, and sort of antagonistic effects that destroy certain hop compounds, quite simply because they are lower in these, in these compounds that do survive the brewing process. So to put a finer point on that, we'll move on to the next slide, uh, which gives a practical use case, right? So this is a way to think about it. So the first way that I would recommend using this graph is to use high survivable hops early. Uh, and I put or late because I don't want you to think that that's how they can only be used. But 
in, in general, I would say uh, a, a good example of this that I've kind of already referenced is Idaho 7 is likely a better choice for high impact whirlpool hopping than Cascade. This is because Idaho 7 just contains more of what's going to survive the whirlpool process than Cascade does. Doesn't mean that Cascade's a bad hop. This is not a good bad graph. What it does mean is um, for that specific usage scenario of whirlpool, we, we would do well as brewers to think about what hop is going to have enough compounds to survive that, that situation because it is being exposed to heat. So that's one way to think about this graph here. Uh, let's go ahead and move to the second scenario. So uh, this one, it, it basically states once again, use low survivables hops late in the brewing process. So an, an, an example that we, that we see here is cashmere, uh, which is relatively low in survivables compared to some of the other varieties on this graph, will likely make a higher impact in finished beer if used later in the brewing process. And this is quite simply, cashmere does not have as many things that are going to survive heat and survive fermentation than something like you know, Idaho 7 or the cryopop blend does. So if we want to basically, we, we don't want brewers to waste their money or waste their time, right? If you're gonna pay good money for some gorgeous cashmere hops, we want you to be able to deploy those cashmere hops where they're going to make their highest impact in your finished beer and contribute positively to the, to the finished beer aroma. Cashmere is likely to find its, its highest success based on the analytics that we see here uh, when used later in the brewing process, such as a post firm dry hop. Uh, the third uh, scenario or takeaway that we can get from this graph is uh, a, a really fascinating idea for me and for, as, as a brewer, and this is something that I wish I had known when I was more actively brewing uh, regularly, which is the idea of blending hops to maximize beneficial concentrations. So blending is not a new thing. Most brewers are blending hops on some level. We think about it, uh, generally speaking, from a raw hop sensory standpoint. So that's kind of the basic model, which is like this hop smells like this, this hop smells like this. Um, if I blend them together, hopefully they'll make an impact in finished beer that smells like some combination of that. And that is, that's, that's one sort of, uh, raw hop sensory is one, one aspect of how we evaluate hops. But what we see based on this, on these, on this R&D um, efforts that we've made, this, this research shows that we're likely to make more dynamic blends if we're more strategic about balancing beneficial concentrations between varieties. And I'll give, a, give an example of what I mean. So laurel is high in linalool and so and talus is high in geraniol. And so the two of those hops together are more likely to make a dynamic uh, aroma impact than two hops, for example, like laurel and crystal, which are both very high in linalool, which would lead to just kind of a very tipped scale in favor of linalool, but not much geraniol concentration and kind of lacking in some of the overall balance of concentrations that we would like to see uh, to really, when I say dynamic uh, hop blend, what I mean is ultimately something that's providing a really gorgeous range of flavors that's gonna make a beer pop uh, rather than just being kind of one noted. So uh, laurel and talus are, are more likely to be a more dynamic hop combination than laurel and crystal. And that's quite simply because they're balancing different combinations in contrast with one another to create a, a, a hop blend that's very rich in uh, multiple compound types. Uh, and then moving on to our fourth uh, scenario. Uh, this is one of, I, I think, my favorite implications of this research is to think about solubility. That's ultimately what we're discussing here. Um, that's kind of, if you only took one uh, takeaway from this entire webinar, what I would say is, to focus on beer solubility, right? And so thinking about beer solubility, what we wanna do is get compounds dissolved into our wort stream and in as many points in the process as possible. So uh, loading wort streams with survivables early can uh, create conditions necessary for bi beneficial biotransformation, which is a concept that Pat mentioned already. So um, a Whirlpool addition, for example, with Idaho 7 is likely to dissolve a lot of uh, high impact um, compounds into the wort stream, and then additionally dry hopping with uh, hops like Sabro and Simcoe could yield a huge flavor impact quite simply because we're loading that wort stream really early with a huge array of very dynamic, potentially biotransformable uh, comp compounds into the wort stream at a very early stage. And that's going to give uh, ultimately what we believe to be the conditions necessary for potentially allowing that yeast to interact with the hop compounds and uh, create more dynamic flavors. So 
load the work stream early with high concentrations of survivables to help benefit uh, the final product. So uh, the graph is, I think, just a tremendous tool. I, we could spend, honestly, hours on just the graph itself, but in the interest of time, we'll keep moving here. Um, but I think it's really the, the fruit and the keystone of all of our research. So I encourage people to, uh, to utilize it uh, when they're thinking about recipe design. But to really uh, think about sort of the fruit of this research, uh, we are uh, ultimately beer fans just as much as we are researchers and people who uh, spend a lot of time thinking about it from an analytical level. So naturally, our, our, our uh, desire, uh, basically within the same breath of starting to talk about this research, we started to think about how can we make this into a product that, that's, that would make great beer, right? And, make, uh, and provide a solution for brewers. So what's been born of this is Cryopop, which a lot of you are probably familiar with at this point. It was released about a month ago. This is a blend of hops that specifically is born out of this research. I would, I would call it like the most practical fruit possible of all of this research. And um, essentially what we did is, is attempt to put all of these research theories into a, into a product, something that brewers can use to make the best beer possible. So um, this blend is, is designed specifically with beer solubility in mind, a very balanced and dynamic array of, of these survivable compounds. It's a supercharged pellet that provides brewers with a dynamic solution for juicy fruit forward and highly aromatic applications, showing massive tropical stone fruit and citrus aromas. So in a nutshell, what we're talking about is a cryo pellet that produces huge amounts of tropical stone fruit and citrus aromas because of its, its, um, its focus on, on solubility. So um, this is a product that's been in the works for, I mean, if you go back to the beginnings of the research, probably three years, right? So this is something we've been working on for a long time. A lot of you have gotten to use it already and have seen how well it works in beer. We continue to see that these theories are playing out in a, in a practical way, which is very exciting for us, right? It's, it's all well and good to talk about stuff from a science and, and theoretical angle. It's another thing to be able to actually drink the fruit of that and see like, yes, this is making a huge impact in Finnish beer. So we're very proud of what this has done so far and just very, uh, very excited for what it's doing in the market for people. Um, we'll take a look at some different use cases in just a moment here uh, when the next slide comes up. Uh, oh, and just to take a, uh, just a step back briefly uh, and show you where the cryopop blend is on the graph. This is, uh, this, it shows up very at the, at the very uh, top of the graph. And what I particularly love about the, about the cryopop blend is you can see the balance between components, right? because it's not just about having the most components, it's about having this very dynamic array of components that, that yields these synergies between compounds. So it's got a beautifully dynamic array of compounds. It's, uh, it's really well balanced between them and ultimately it's very heavily concentrated in them. So it's going to provide a lot of soluble compounds in any use case situation. So, so moving forward, uh, what we see is that there are a number of different ways to use this blend. This is something that we, uh, we see as a really dynamic solution for, for sort of all brewer types. Um, so a conventional way to think about it would be a brewer looking for a go-to solution for all of their juicy, hazy, or fruit forward beers, right? So for a brewer who's like, hey, I'm producing a new a rotating IPA every week. Um, I'm a little bit fatigued trying to think about new hop combinations every time. This is a solution that could be 50% of every hop bill that you ever produce, right? It is pre-blended to be uh, extremely dynamic to produce this gorgeous canvas of fruit flavors. So this is something that every IPA you produce, you could do 50% of your blend is cryopop and then build other varieties on top of it to, to increase your, your variation. And it's going to work extremely well in that situation. Uh, for also a brewer needing to make a, needing a user-friendly solution to help them make market relevant beer. So perhaps there's brewers out there that have been brewing for a long time but maybe it's been in you know, continental lagers and, and very traditional styles and, and uh, IPAs are a relatively new thing for them. This is a solution that's, that's going to be extremely user-friendly. You can really deploy it at any point in the process and it's going to produce excellent results that are very, very market uh, relevant. So I, I see that as a, as a really um, an advantage for brewers who are maybe a little bit new to the, to the IPA space. Um, to get a little bit more strategic or uh, maybe what you might call like a little bit more of like a, a sort of a granular look at how to use this product for brewers who are very tuned in to these the to hop chemistry and the different compounds going into their beer. This is a blend that a brewer could use uh, when they're focusing on maximizing contributions from individual hop compounds. So for example, if a brewer is looking at a blend and is like, I would, uh, I would, I think this blend is really cool, but it's really lacking in geraniol. What can I, what can I include to kind of boost that level? 
the cryopop blend is going to be able to deliver upon that because of its high concentrations of, of those compounds. And ultimately, I think the most fascinating thing about this for us as an industry and where it can lead uh, into the future is this is great for a brewer who's desiring to bridge the gap between raw hop aroma and finished beer. That's such a common question that we get and such a common sort of pain point for brewers is like, this hop smelled like this when I smelled it in its raw format. It smelled like peaches and apricots, but then in beer, it smells quite different, right? How do I bridge the gap between those two concepts? By looking at solubility and by looking at, the, at essentially working backwards from uh, what we know is soluble, we can make those connections between what will actually make it into finished beer and what won't, right? This is a huge step forward for the industry to think about, uh, to kind of change our headspace about what raw hop analysis should look like and how it should bear into our decision making. So a uh, lot of implications there. So, and moving forward, I believe that I'm going to uh, pass it over to Tessa right now. Oh, actually a couple more slides. So I'll just, uh, I'll keep this brief uh, so that we don't run out of time here. Uh, we do have three recipes that we've created that, that sort of highlight these different use case situations. One of these would be to use this, uh, this blend as a single hop. So it's pre-blended. It's already going to be uh, blended into ratios that are going to make absolute perfect uh, sense in beer and are going to produce excellent results. So this is a beer, a New England IPA that uses uh, the cryopop blend as a single hop, essentially. A big, uh, a, a relatively moderate uh, Whirlpool edition a big active fermentation dry hop addition, which is going to amplify that biotransformation potential. And then a, uh, a, a more modest uh, finishing dry hop at, at a, at a post-firm situation, which is gonna produce just this gorgeous array of mango, grapefruit, peach, and floral notes and uh, produce excellent beer. The next recipe is a different use case situation, which is using the blend as an amplifier. So sort of using it like a, a chef would use salt to sort of heighten the, the flavors that are coming out in the rest of a dish. So this is actually a blend of hops, including Warrior, Talus, Simcoe, but we're utilizing small amounts of the cryopop blend to actually amplify other hops. And because of those high concentrations of linalool, geraniol, and a few others, we know that actually this blend has the potential to really boost up the character of other hops. So for example, make your citra taste more citra. That's one of the common feedbacks that we get. So utilizing this blend as sort of like a brewing salt or, or a brewing amplifier is a great way to think about it. And I would do that in some, on some level it's between 20 to 40% of the, of the overall hot blend can really help amplify other flavors. The third use case situation is uh, what we described as creating the conditions necessary for biotransformation. So uh, this is utilizing the cryopop blend really early uh, in a whirlpool situation and in an active firm dry hop. And what this is designed to do, as I mentioned earlier, is to load a wort stream up very early on with all of the compounds that are basically creating the, the perfect storm of, 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 of conditions to help uh, yeast be able to biotransform um, and metabolize certain compounds to make that beneficial effect. So, um, so a third use case recipe here, which kind of shows that in detail, all of which are very valid ways to use cryopop and, and, and show kind of the range of ways that it can be used to, uh, to sort of amplify, um, uh, be, a, be a dynamic tool in a brewer's toolbox. So. And with that, I will pass it over to Tessa, who's going to describe some of the sensory research that went into the creation of Cryopop. Awesome. Thanks, Hunter. Yeah, so we're kind of taking a little bit of a step back into the kind of R&D uh, realm uh, of the development of Cryopop. So we, you know, using Pat and Jackie's analytical research, uh, trialed many iterations of this blend, and we were brewing with it and um, doing sensory on it the whole time. But uh, when we kind of landed on that final blend, uh, we designed a couple of experiments to sort of, I don't know, it's like we had this diamond and we wanted to like hold it up to the light and like look at it from some different angles and just kind of um, make sure it was kind of doing what we thought it would do. And um, and uh, long story short, it did, I guess. But um, this is sort of the first bit of exploration we did with that final blend. Um, we brewed two different uh, well, we brewed the same recipe but the, of beer, but the only thing we changed was the timing of um, our addition of the cryopop blend. So uh, in one, we added the um, cryopop blend during um, you know, active fermentation, and then in the other, we added it uh, uh, post-fermentation. So two dry hop conditions, exact same beer in every other way. And we actually did this in triplicate uh, to make really, really sure, because uh, we like to nerd out and do things properly in the properly scientific way um, and 
basically, uh, we had our internal sensory panel, uh, you know, assess blind coded randomized uh, samples of each of these uh, brewing conditions. And the results are here on the spider diagram. Um, and kind of the main things we noticed, I'll go through it kind of quickly just so we make sure we have time for questions. But um, adding the cryopop during that active fermentation dry hop phase um, really you know, we got some pretty different results here. So the, the red line there is active firm and we got this um, pretty big, I think statistically significant uh, spike in the sweet aromatic complex, which is kind of that like bubble gum, honey, um, candy like uh, realm. And the, um, the main kind of minor flavor characteristics most frequently reported by those panelists were peach, uh, pineapple, strawberry, guava, mango, orange. So it's kind of this like, tropical cocktail, um, uh, you know, fruit smoothie, really, really nice flavors. Um, I think the sensory panel was pretty happy to be participating on this project. Um, and then, you know, we had the, the condition where we added it uh, post fermentation dry hop, and it still was really good. Um, we got a little bit more kind of in that stone fruit palm melon, just a bit more kind of green fruit, um, a bit more herbal and a bit more woody. Um, and the, the minor characteristics kind of tended more toward peach grapefruit. And then we had mango, pineapple, pine, and sweetgrass, which are a little, maybe sharper, a little bit more like, um, smelled more like the hops smelled, which makes sense. We added them a little bit later. Um, but all this definitely suggests that something was happening uh, during that active fermentation phase with the, with the yeast. There are some interactions going on. Um, you know, people throw around the word biotransformation a lot. We like to be careful with that. We can't, you know, say for sure that that's exactly what was happening there. Um, but there does seem to be some kind of amplification uh, happening when these, when this hop was added uh, during that active fermentation phase um, with those bigger kind of sweet aromatic floral um, tropical, tropical notes. Um, so and then we'll move on to kind of the next uh, little exploration we did. Um, and to, this one's kind of hard to explain, but just um, the idea behind this was like, is cryopop uh, greater than the sum of its parts is sort of the question we were uh, trying to answer here. So we did uh, one brew where we added um, cryopop as the dry hop. And then we did a handful of other brews where we dry hopped with um, basically each component of the cryopop blend. And then um, after, and it was dry hop um, all around. And then um, after fermentation and packaging, we actually blended those constituents at the same ratio that they appear in the cryopop blend. So to make it basically like we have the cryopop blend and then a blend of beers that should technically have like the same concentration of compounds as uh, the cryopop blend, but they had all been brewed separately. I hope that makes sense. I know it's like a little bit complicated. Um, but basically uh, what we saw was that uh, the beer that we made with the crowd pot blend just had a little bit, um, it was a bit more, uh, uh, it imparted a bit more flavor. It was just kind of more flavorsome. So um, here on this spider diagram, you can see that um, cryo pop beer is in red. So we just kind of had like slightly higher flavor impact all around when those hop compounds that are in the blend were present together during fermentation. Whereas this post package blend of constituents, um, all those hop compounds were there, but they were fermented kind of separately and then added together. Um, and, you know, we just like see a little bit less of um, most of the compounds we're quite interested in, particularly I think um, the stone fruit and berry and floral um, were pretty impactful. And we, we didn't put it on the slide, but, um, just to note that the, the minor characteristics most frequently reported by the panelists uh, for this post package blend of constituents were apple, pear, cantaloupe, banana, uh, lemon, and bubble gum, which is like good, um, you know, no off notes there really. Uh, but for the crowd pop beer, the highest reported minor characteristics were peach, pineapple, strawberry, guava, mango, and orange. So identical hops. Uh, imparting compounds which um, like you know should have imparted an identical uh, concentration of hop compounds into the beer matrix and yet when they were all present together during that um, fermentation we seem to have really amplified a lot of those really pleasant 
juicy um, uh, tropical flavors, which um, is quite interesting. And, and I guess the, the conclusion we drew from that was that um, there must be some kind of synergistic activity happening uh, within the blend, within the compounds within the blend, um, that those compounds need to be together during fermentation to, to, make, that, um, to make that happen. So that was pretty interesting for us. Um, and this is kind of speaking a bit to the cyclical nature of research. Um, you know, we did all this research, we created this blend, uh, we did some brewing research, and now based on the results of this brewing research, we'll probably kind of like go back to the beginning and do it all again, and just like keep going through this cycle of improvement as we learn, you know, how this um, analytical research that Jackie and Pat um, have been doing for years is impacting this beer sensory uh, research that we're also doing, and um, we'll just go around and round in a beautiful uh, cycle of beer flavor um, that I'm so happy to be part of. <laughs> and my panelists are happy to be a part of it too, because uh, they don't always get to taste nice things in panel. Sometimes we do like off flavor research. And uh, so I think that uh, this has been really nice for them. <laughs> um, and then I think we just have one more slide. Uh, or I have one more slide. Um, this is our new uh, kind of updated lexicon. And we just kind of wanted to to finish on this um, because one, you know, it's all the survivable hop compound research we've been discuss discussing really comes down to like making beer that tastes great. And um, a lexicon is a super powerful tool um, to like keep all of our research all the researchers here at YCH kind of speaking the same flavor language, um, uh, keeping us all on the same page as far as um, what our targets are for flavor and, and what we're trying to amplify or maybe what we're trying to reduce. And um, also just a really fun and beautiful graphic, thanks to our uh, graphic designer, who I, I think did such a good job of making it uh, very pleasant to look at as well as scientifically powerful. So uh, you guys can keep an eye out for, I think, there will be poster versions of this coming out soon. And I know that I will definitely have one uh, on my wall. But um, yeah, so uh, that's all I have. Um, and I think we'll kick it back to you guys. Thanks, Tessa. One of the things too that I, I think is uh, worth mentioning, you mentioned <clears throat> that we'll have a poster of the sensory lexicon at some point soon. We also have poster versions of the survivables chart, which is something that I would recommend to have on every brewer's wall. Uh, truly, I think if you had the lexicon on one side and the survivables chart on the other side, you would have the full range of, of what we would call like beer analytics, right? So it's the sensory and lab combined is, is kind of the full picture of what a beer is doing for people. So that's, I, I, I would uh, encourage people to kind of uh, look, keep a lookout for that or contact your local salesperson to make sure that we can provide you with something like that. And if you haven't, ultimately, there's been page numbers to follow along with at the bottom of this presentation. But if you don't have a copy of the Survivables Handbook, that's something that we can get for you. It's also downloadable um, off of our Hop and Brew School page or our web page. And uh, it's the deep dive. It's kind of the manifesto of, of all of these things that we've been talking about today. And it goes into very great detail, has a lot of definitions and glossary and things like that. So um, we fully expect this research to continue. And we hope that we're uh, rapidly making progress over the next few years, but we're very excited where we've arrived at, the, at this point. And, and thank you all of you for letting us get to speak about it today. And I, I hope we'll have some questions to answer here. Yeah, we do have some questions. Um, if you can, there have been some questions that have been answered in the Q&A section to um, kind of look through. Um, we have one for the panel. Uh, did cryopop develop more flavors at 185 degrees Fahrenheit in the whirlpool? That's a good question. We haven't done any specific trials on it with this product specifically, uh, like between 212, for example, or like 100 degrees Celsius versus, you know, versus something like 80 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> we have a lot of brewers utilizing it that way, doing a pre-chilled whirlpool. Um, this is my opinion and you take it for what it is. I don't necessarily believe that more compounds per unit are surviving at uh, 180 or 185 versus 212. I think the main benefit of a pre-chilled Whirlpool as a brewer is being able to utilize more hops in your Whirlpool situations without getting too much bitterness, right? So I don't know that like per pound of hops that you're getting a whole lot more solubility or a whole lot more compound surviving. 
what you can do at 185 that you can't do at 212 is potentially add two pounds per barrel versus just one pound per barrel because of you know the, the potential uh, impact of like, if you only have 40 IBUs to work with, you're gonna get to 40 IBUs pretty quickly if you're using heavy, heavy amounts of Whirlpool hops, right? So I think that's the main benefit of a chilled Whirlpool in my opinion. And uh, Pat and Tessa might have different opinions on that, but I, I see that as the main brewer advantage is being able to keep your IBUs low while utilizing a large quantity of aromatic material uh, in, a, in a Whirlpool situation. So I don't know if either of you guys have commentary on that. That's, that's sort of my two cents on it. Good question though. And then how can I manage multiple DHs in their duration in case that a fermentation is faster or more vigorous than expected? Yeah, so I think probably uh, what you're describing is like the how to, how to pair up an active fermentation dry hop with a post-fermentation dry hop and like how to include that in the brewing process. And, you know, Tessa or Pat, I'm not sure if you have opinions here. Just from a practical level, what I recommend is like, don't, I would say don't get too hung up on like nailing a specific timing uh, within the active fermentation dry hop. As you mentioned, some yeast strains ferment faster than others. And eventually, I think if you do it enough times, you'll get a sense of like how fast your, your, you know, your yeast is fermenting and stuff like that. In general, if a person's looking for an active fermentation dry hop, I encourage them to, to try to hit somewhere between four and eight degrees Plato left to go in fermentation. That's kind of a nice middle window of your fermentation. If you do it too, too early, it can be kind of challenging. Like if your beer starts fermenting, you know, you brew one day and then your beer starts fermenting overnight and you're like, well, I didn't get here in time or I'm going to have to, I don't want you to have to go in it like in the middle of the night to dry hop your beer just because you think it's going to make it super, you know, really aromatic. I think if you try to hit that window of like four to eight degrees Play-Doh left to go, that that will be really successful. Anecdotally in the market, we, you know, among the brewers that we work with, we see that being a really nice um, sweet spot for that. And then post firm, I would say, uh, you know, I always recommend trying to hit it where, where it's still a little bit of activity going on. Maybe you've got one degree Play-Doh or a half a degree Play-Doh left to go. And then you do your post-firm dry hop at that point. Technically, there's still a little of the fermentation going on. So it's not truly post-firm, but I feel like that's the nice sweet spot for people where the beer is still warm and uh, you're going to get really good solubility and you can get really good solubility in a very short period of time. So no need to really leave the beer on dry hops for a long period of time. Get it in there. Um, 24 hours to 48 hours. And generally speaking, after that, you can dump because most of your, your compounds are going to be soluble at that point. And anything beyond that is generally diminishing returns. So that would be my just really high level recommendations. Uh, Tessa or Pat, I don't know if you have anything you want to add there. I was actually just going to say like what you described was basically exactly what we did in that experiment uh, where we did post and active. So that's what I would have recommended as well. A lot of the advice that we give is based on just what we see brewers doing out in the market and things that are successful for them. We do all, a lot of our own experiments, but at the end of the day, <clears throat> all of you are researchers in your own right out there and we gather data and, and sort of feedback from brewers all the time about what's, what's working, what's making good beer. Those tend to be some really nice sort of timings for brewers that seem to work well in beer um, for, for those two different dry hops. It can make yeast harvesting a challenge. That is one of the biggest drawbacks of active fermentation dry hopping. That's something that you'll have to kind of think about for your own operational purposes is how you can have healthy pitches of yeast for the next generation of beer that you're brewing. And there are different strategies to tackle that. And that's probably a bigger topic for maybe another time. But, um, but that's in general, I would say that the way I would go. So hopefully that answers the question. Is there a significant difference in the aromatics for post-ferment dry hop at room temperature versus 47 degrees Fahrenheit? Tessa, do you want to, I don't know if you want to tackle that at all. I have like some personal experience with those kinds of things, but. Yeah, I mean, we've not run like a specific <clears throat> trial on that. So Spencer, I'll let you speak to your personal experience. Yeah, I would say for a lot of reasons, we have a, a webinar on dry hopping where we went into this in like really great detail that was part of last year's Hop and Brew School. So I would say I would, for anybody that's interested in this topic, I would really recommend that webinar because we do talk about it in pretty heavy detail. But for a lot of reasons, I don't tend to recommend a chilled dry hop. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons is that it tends to maybe set you up uh, for negative hop creep experiences down the road if you don't have a really keen strategy for how to manage your ha a dry hop creep. 
dry hop creep tends to be more prevalent at some of those colder temperatures, uh, colder dry hop temperatures, because the, uh, the fermentation isn't all the way finishing. Um, but in general, I would say we tend to experience more pleasant flavors coming from hops at a warmer temperature. Just speaking in really broad strokes, uh, dry hops that take place at ale fermentation temperatures, so something like 18 to 22 C or, or you know, whatever, 65 to 75 Fahrenheit, tends to be more on the fruity end of the spectrum, more floral and, and aromatic. Um, there are plenty of people that do very successful uh, chilled dry hops, so down in the 50 Fahrenheit range. Um, what we find though is that it can often be, there can tend to be an ex, a, 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 a tendency to extract some of the harsher flavors and hops at those, at those uh, temperatures. So more on the woody grassy end of the spectrum. It's absolutely possible to do it successfully. I just find that it requires a little bit more care and sort of uh, attention to detail to do it at that cold temperature. I know it can be tempting for some brewers to do it because of the ability to soft crash, which can help you harvest yeast and get, uh, you know, get a, a pitch ready for your next uh, generation. I would encourage you to mess around with it. My, my main advice would be if you're going to dry hop heavily at lower temperatures, so something like 40, 45, you know, 45 to 55 Fahrenheit, make sure that you are very, very vigilant about the possibility for hop creep in your beer. Because oftentimes the, the, the tendency for hop creep will be masked by the cold temperatures and will show up later downstream as a problem in package, for example, and in, in, in you start to have issues in can or in the keg. So if you are gonna ferment at colder temperatures, or uh, dry hop at colder temperatures, by all means, it can be very successful. Just be sure that you're paying very, very close attention to the possibility of additional dry hop creep at those temperatures, because that can be an exacerbated phenomenon uh, down there. So it's a good question. I, re I recommend that, that dry hop webinar. It's a, it goes into great detail, so. Is there any information about styles in the cryopop blend? Yeah, Pat, you want to fire away on that one? I was enjoying my silence. No, <laughs> there actually is, if you look on the graph, there's actually three Mercato hexanol, and that's the one that made it because that's the one we see on the most consistent basis, basis on every hop. And there's a lot more that we listed in the presentation, but they're just not showing up on it as it's consistent. It Sorry about that. Anyway, I mean, we, we do try to target as many as we can in one shot. So sometimes our methodology is set that we don't dive in on one specific compound. We're trying to tackle multiple compounds and compounds in one screening as quickly as we possibly can. So three more capital hexanol is the one you'll see. So. They also did um, just want to see if any of the panelists looked at the um, questions that were answered already throughout the um, throughout the presentation to kind of revisit to make sure anyone watching later, if they thought that any stood out, um, please just let me know and we can kind of revisit that uh, verbally. Yeah, I think the one uh, Tony Lynn is worth addressing about is the graph subject to change season to season. I think this is a really important topic that we should mention about the graph is um, this is something that probably will morph over time. The better and more harvest data that we have over successive years, the better the graph will ultimately be. Um, we had some specific criteria for creating the graph. We, would, we did not include any varieties for which we weren't able to examine three or more lots of that variety. So if it's something that we only receive one lot, we generally speaking did not include it in the graph because we didn't feel like that was a reliable enough data set to include it. So we are working to make sure that we're, what we're looking at is not just based upon one lot or one instance, but it's a, it's a re representative sort of varietal average of what of what's that's going to look like. So in short, I would say the more harvest that we have under our belt under this framework, the, the less the graph should look variable. So because it's going to be averaged over a longer period of time. And um, it's also worth noting that these research methods are really new. Uh, we did not, and Pat can speak to this more, but... <clears throat> There was not an ASBC standard, for example, on, on how to pursue this type of, of sort of identification and research of compounds. So these methods were created by Pat and his team sort of in real time. And some of that requires uh, continuous validation of the method. So as we go along, we get better and better at making sure that what, what we think we're seeing, we actually are seeing. 
And so for when we identify a sulfur compound, for example, that we know like, yes, it indeed is three mercaptohexanol or, or whatever we think it is. So uh, though we feel really good about the, the where we're at right now as an, as a, from a research perspective, I, I expect and, and I hope that we will have actually outdated ourselves within a few years, right? That, that we will know so much more by continuing down this path within a few years that, we, that the graph may look different and more sophisticated and more accurate as time goes along. Um, it's definitely not an overstatement to say that we're on the frontiers with this. Like this is a, this is a new, new frontier for, for hop research. So we're, we're kind of actively making the discoveries as we go along and, and sharing those with brewers as, as, as time passes. So Pat, I, I don't know if that summarizes it from your side or if you feel good about that, but that's, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah, you pretty much hit it right on. It's, it's even in just normal hop analysis, you're always trying to find a way to improve it, to be better at it at every instance. So it's coupled to grow and we'll add a lot more. Hopefully we'll add more compounds that we currently aren't seeing, but they truly are surviving the beer and we'll just get better as we go. Um, th that was the one I called out from there, Tony Lynn. I know we've got some other ones to answer that we can do in real time here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is it possible, possible to know which hops are used for the cryopop blend and will there be more versions of this product? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so one of our core sort of ethos uh, points is transparency. That's something that we've always prided ourselves on as a company. Um, so we do get asked a lot, you know, what's in the blend? Is it something that we can know? We've actually talked about it a lot and, and, and have decided at this, at, at least at this time that we're not going to reveal what's in the blend. The reason why is because we're desiring a specific profile and specific grouping of compounds, we actually reserve the right to potentially change varieties from time to time, right? And that's one of the beauties of blending versus single varietals is if, for example, Cascade or something like that had a bad harvest year, we potentially, if that were in the blend, could swap it out with another variety that's going to hit these different compound levels and not necessarily need to rely upon Cascade for that purpose, right? Cascade's not in the blend for what it's worth. But just using it as an example, um, it, it provides us a tremendous advantage to make sure that that brewer tool is consistent year over year because we are specifically, specifically focusing more on the compounds than the individual varieties that are delivering them. We do expect the product line to develop over time. And in fact, we have two beta blends that accompany this original cryopop blend that we're working on right now that are more in the R&D stage still. So they're about a year behind where the cryopop blend is. And we're, we're currently making, we've made small quantities of those and are trying them out in beer and, and things like that. And that's, that's something that's very exciting because it's kind of allowing us to further further iterate upon what the cryopop blend does and sort of specify specific flavors and things like that. And ultimately we feel like we're going to be able to provide brewers purpose-built tools that are like, this blend was designed for Whirlpool. Or this blend was designed to hit a berry-like profile. Think, you know, things like that that are going to further equip a brewer to, to be very successful. So um, long story short, right now we're not going to say what's in the blend because we, we think it could change over time. There could come a time where we're willing to do that. Um, one of the other things that I'll say about that just real briefly is there are varieties that are commercially available in the blends. Uh, not all of them are commercially available, but um, one of the things that makes it special is not so much that, for example, if you if I told you the blend was Cascade and, and, uh, and Warrior, it's not so much that you can't go out and get Cascade and Warrior. One of the things that makes it so special to, to be where we're located is that we bring in 40 million pounds of bales a year, right? And the tremendous advantage of that is not only do we get to pick Cascade to go into the blend, we can pick this very specific lot of Cascade that is very high in geraniol, for example, and we know that it's going to deliver that specific component into the blend. So even if we gave the exact proportions of the blend, I, it would be hard to replicate what it is, just specifically because we have such a breadth of material to be able to pull from to create the product. And that's really, I think, one of the advantages of uh, our grower network that allows us to be able to do that. And, and so that's, that's another way to kind of think about it. So hopefully that answers your question. It's a, it's a good one. 
Has any work been done regarding active fermentation with Kvik temperatures ranging upwards of 39 degrees Celsius? Lisa, I don't think we've had any Kvik cryopop beers yet, have we? Uh, no, we haven't. Some of these questions are so specific. Um, and I feel like we do a lot of research for just not like these specific things. And as a scientist, it's hard for me to like extrapolate if I haven't seen it firsthand with a designed experiment, which is why I always take it over to Spencer because he's much more comfortable with extrapolation. <laughs> I am comfortable shooting from the hip. You are correct, uh, Tessa. The, uh, no, I, what I would say is Quebec um, is not something that we at, uh, at Yakima Chief, we don't, in, it's not one of our house strains. We don't work with it regularly. We have occasion, we have used it maybe once or twice in the past. <clears throat> Just speaking from my experience out in the market, I find that it tends to produce pretty variable results among brewers. It seems to be very convenient that it can per ferment at really hot temperatures, but I don't necessarily see always that it's producing reliably great beer at those hot temperatures. Um, so I, I there's some brewers that are deploying it really, really well. I tend to really encourage brewers to maybe just focus more on, on, on traditional sack strains when they're trying to, to hone in on some of these hazy IPA production techniques. I find that cold strains and London Ale 3 and things like that tend to be a little more reliable and a little more predictable on, on producing like really excellent results from these, from these concepts. But by all means, I think that's a frontier that we, we ought to explore more. Quebec is producing some really interesting beer, um, but we haven't ourselves um, dove in on it yet, I guess, at that, at that point. So. If you do it, let us know how it goes. Um, yeah, we'd love to try some beer. If you want to send some over, we'll do sensory analysis on it. Absolutely. So I see that uh, that Kurt has encouraged me to get out into the sun a little on occasion. I, I agree with that, Kurt. I'm actually in a room with hellacious fluorescent lighting, which is part, part of the reason why I, I think I look so so pale. But luckily, I live in Yakima now, which means that uh, that it, the sun, as if for anybody who's ever been here, you'll know that it, it really never rains. So sun all the time, so I shouldn't have any trouble with that. But uh, but yeah, I, I, I appreciate the advice. Unsolicited. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> Sometimes advice comes your way whether you whether you ask for it or not. So. Um, I also saw a question regarding the scale of the graph, which is something that I felt like it might be worth addressing, Pat. Uh, what, that's one of the questions that we get from time to time is, is that what the scale of the graph is and how to, how to interpret that. And so I don't know if you want to comment on that at all. The scale of the graph is basically because the way we chose a bar chart is to show relatively where each variety is to kind of give it a nice, easy look. And the reason why you don't see the, like the actual concentrations, uh, when we first set it out on this research, it was hard to find every analytical standard, which made it a issue for some of the compounds that we saw were surviving. In, in the hops and then also with the idea that there some of them are at way different concentrations such as polyphenols or polyfunctional thiols. They are essentially so low in concentration compared to the other compounds that we had to scale them in such a way that they could actually show up on the graph together. So that's basically the reason why it's designed the way it is. Easy to look at. I always encourage people too to remember that it, it's it, that graph is really a brewer tool more than it is like a data set, a pure data set. So as Pat mentioned, if if we put everything in PPB, for example, you probably wouldn't be able to see 3MH at all. It's so much less than it, than the other compounds that. So some of it is for for visual purposes is uh, is put on there just to so that you can see the relative compound com, compound concentrations between varieties. And that's mainly what we want it to be used for is like. So you can see that like talus is higher in geraniol than warrior, for example. And so me meant to be used more as a comparison tool rather than necessarily like, hey, you know, talus has whatever, 300 PPB of, of geraniol or something like that. So hopefully that answers the question. If you ever want to know those specific data, we can help you with that. But it's the graph was not was not aided by doing that, I think. Sorry, Tessa, I think I interrupted you. Oh, no, I was just going to say it's also worth keeping in mind that they all have such different sensory thresholds as well. So just because there's more of this compound than the other compound doesn't mean it's going to smell like more of that compound than the other compound. Um, sometimes the, the thresh, sensory threshold, 
holds are orders of magnitude different between the compounds. So another thing worth keeping in mind when looking at that graph. Looks like we've got a question about from Kurt, my buddy Kurt, about uh, why dumping hops 24 to 48 hours after post from dry hop versus waiting an extra do day or two to verify there isn't any hop creep. <clears throat> um, so the reason why I would recommend that is once those enzymes, so hop creep is generally thought to be caused by specific enzymes that are present in hops that are essentially working on some of the long chain sugars that are left over in the wort stream and converting those into short chain sugars and then therefore making them fermentable, which can cause additional fermentation and, and sort of stuff like that down the road. Based on everything that we see thus far, once those enzymes are in the beer, they're in there. So it doesn't matter if you dump the hops after just you know a short amount of time afterwards, those enzymes are still going to be present in the beer. So essentially the damage is going to be done to the beer, so to speak, like you know, from a from an uh, enzyme conversion perspective, regardless of the of, of like how long that the, the you keep the hops in there. So I would I would recommend that you dry hop or that you dump your dry hops after a relatively short period of time specifically to avoid a contribution of from some of the plant fraction of the hops, right? So some of the negative flavor contribution, like some of the grassier, harsher flavors, you still should monitor for hop creep after that. So you still should leave your beer warm for a few days, assure that there's no hop creep going on because those enzymes are still going to be present in the word stream and likely have already done any enzymatic conversion of some of those uh, starches in the beer already. So it's still very possible for additional fermentation to happen after the hops have been dumped from the beer. That's generally speaking, so we're kind of talking about two separate phenomena. Dump the hops so that they don't neg they have negative flavor contributions. Monitor the beer for dry hop creep because that could happen kind of regardless of, of when you dump the hops. So Pat, did I, I didn't, did I make any chemical errors in that statement? No, feeling good, okay. I live in I live in fear of, of luckily Pat's a very uh, he's very gentle in his corrections but I live in fear of, of of misspeaking about something from a chemical level, so great question. Well, we've, got, we've got a question about why um, there's pop in the name cryopop. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because it makes beer pop. That's the uh, that's the <laughs> ultimately what we want here is something it, you know from a naming perspective. We want the name to tell you exactly what it's designed to do, right? It's cryo, meaning that it's a concentrated pellet and it pops, right? It, it, it makes aromas pop out of beer. That's, that's really nothing more, more sort of scientific than that. It's, uh, it's designed to help aroma pop out of the, out of the glass. It's designed to uh, basically amplify flavors, uh, you know, and sort of synergize between one another, which is sort of like uh, the, the cryo pop technology, if you want to look at it as just how to, how to make aroma pop out of the glass. And we're doing it in a cryo format. So that's where cryo pop comes from. We also have one last question about sizing available for home brewers. I don't know if you want to touch on that um, for sizing or uh, procuring any product. Uh, you can always reach out to us at hops at yakimachief.com and we can fulfill those needs and get you connected with the right people on package sizing. I'm also so, seeing some funny discourse about the Aroma Dome in the chat, um, whether or not it's available for <laughs> overnight sleepovers. <laughs> not at this time, but uh, we'll consider adding zunks maybe. It is very, it's very peaceful in there. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, please visit the Hop and Brew School event page if you have any, uh, if you're looking for any details or the handbook itself, which can be downloaded. Um, be sure to follow us on social media as well to uh, see any more announcements about other educational resources or events coming up. So thank you all for your time and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. <clears throat>